Thank you all very, very much uh, for, for coming here. Um, it's important, I think, um, to note at the outset, this is the 25th anniversary of the Northridge earthquake. And um, it's, I think, appropriate that we're here talking about public safety on an anniversary like this. Because those of you who've been in the valley long enough to remember that earthquake or any of the other various natural disasters and other things that we experience here, know how much we come to depend uh, for our city's resiliency and our ability to bounce back from things like that, how much we depend on the men and women of the Los Angeles Police Department, men and women of the Los Angeles Fire Department, um, what an incredibly difficult job they have, uh, even on an ordinary day, let alone on an extraordinary day like the one that we experienced 25 years ago tonight. So. Um, I'm glad that we're able to do this and talk about public safety on, on an anniversary like this. I also want to take uh, Jackie Keene, who spoke earlier, is uh, my district director. Um, she, and where, where is Jackie? Wave your hand again. Wave your hand again, Jackie. So Jackie uh, runs our district office. Uh, so if you don't already know her and the rest of my staff, I hope you'll have the chance to do that tonight. Jackie mentioned earlier um, our partnership with Valley College, and I do just want to take a, a moment to thank Valley College and its staff for making this uh, great facility available for us for this evening. Erica Andrew Jonas, the president of Valley College, uh, has been such a terrific partner in everything that we've done, and, and I really want to thank her and wish her uh, the best as she's uh, moving on to Pasadena City College. I want to really wish her all uh, the best. She's been a terrific, terrific partner. Um, and by the way, this evening's event is also streaming live on Facebook. So if there's discussion that we have that you want to go and uh, revisit later, you'll have that opportunity uh, to do. So, um, so uh, and, and along those lines too, if we, I'm going to go through a lot of questions that have been submitted in advance. And if there are questions that you still have that we don't cover tonight, um, this is not your one and only opportunity by any means. We're going to have uh, cards that are available for you to fill out your questions, and uh, even after tonight, we'll go ahead and get responses to you uh, to those questions, whatever they are, however many there are, we will respond to each and every question, and we'll work with the police department and ensure that you get um, your response. Um, so before we hear from Chief Moore, I just want to maybe set a little bit of context for this discussion because uh, I think most of you are motivated to be here uh, around a number of issues that are recurrent, critically important issues that affect our district. Um, and those issues include homelessness and all of the impacts that that, that has had, uh, not just for the homeless population, but for our neighborhoods and our parks and our communities. Um, many of you uh, undoubtedly are here because uh, of the increase that we've had in local property crime, burglaries from cars, home burglaries, uh, and the general sense that I hear so often from my constituents that we need more preventive visibility by the, by the police department in the San Fernando Valley, uh, a, a point that I agree with wholeheartedly. Um, and, and that's I, another issue that we'll be speaking with, uh, speaking about with the, with the chief. Um, some of you are here and motivated because of uh, traffic concerns, traffic safety concerns, and the fact that so many of our neighborhoods have been overwhelmed, really, with uh, cut through traffic, with speeding, with irresponsible drivers who ignore traffic controls and endanger our children and our pedestrians, our bicyclists. Um, that will be another area that we're going to talk about. But before we begin all that, I do want to just say this. We, we often get concerned about crime because of uh, news coverage that we hear, uh, because of social media that we read. Um, we get copies of people's rings, ring video in our email, and it's terrifying. Um, and all of that is, uh, our concerns about crime are very real, um, and they're important. But it's worth also balancing that, and I hope the chief will take uh, some time to do this as well, balancing this with the longer term context 
and realizing that over the last 12 to 15 years, property crime and violent crime in this city has decreased dramatically to the point that this is, even now with the recent increases that we've had, even now this city is uh, just about as safe as it has ever been in my lifetime. Last year, the city had the fewest homicides that we've had in 50 years, 50 years. Um, it wasn't that long ago, and many of you, again, who like me have lived in the Valley for a while, you'll remember some of the dark times of the 1980s when gangs were running wild in the city, when we had a thousand homicides a year or close to it. Um, that number has been reduced by 75, 80%, I think, now. And so um, it's important as we talk about the crime issues that are very real that we have, that we also acknowledge that thanks to the men and women of the Los Angeles Police Department, and thanks to many of you who are in this room who are actively involved in Neighborhood Watch and in our CPABs and um, in community engagement and who've gotten to know our senior lead officers, it's also thanks to you not just to the police department, that we have brought crime rates down uh, the way we have. But there's a lot more still that needs to be done. And uh, since the Great Recession hit in 2008, and since the city has struggled with the budget challenges that we've had, um, it, it's had a real impact. And the police department, thankfully, throughout even the worst of the budget times, we were able to maintain the size of the police department uh, at attrition levels. So the number of sworn officers never went down, even in the worst time of the budget. But they lost a lot of civilian employees, people who do critically important work, um, people who are uh, the ones who do the administrative work for the police department, who do much of the in investigative analysis work and, and other things. Those are civilians um, who weren't there to do that work anymore. And very often, uniformed officers had to fill in to do the work that was otherwise done by civilians. And that means fewer officers on the street. So um, I've been the budget chair of the council, uh, council now for six or seven years. And one of the things that we've most focused on is restoring those civilian positions, and we have. We've made a lot of progress. We have, um, in the last five years, we've added 345 new civilian employees uh, to the Los Angeles Police Department. That's 345 people who are now doing work that civilians can do so that police officers don't have to do that work. Um, we also have taken, I serve on the Metro Board as well, and a really important step that we've taken, and Chief Moore uh, was really engaged in this before he was chief, um, is we've moved the Los Angeles Police Department uh, in to take care of security on Metro. So it used to be done by the Los Angeles Sheriff's Department. The Sheriff still has a part of that. Um, Long Beach Police has a part of that. But the Los Angeles Police Department is now patrolling Metro as well, which means for our district, where we have the red line, where we have the orange line, where we have two subway stations, it means a lot more presence of LAPD officers right here in the district because they're patrolling the Metro line. So it's actually a, a big benefit for this district that we now have 150 Los Angeles police officers who are uh, assigned to patrol Metro uh, bus and rail. Um, so I think um, I was gonna speak a little bit more about um, about some of the things, but, but I know you're, you're here to hear from Chief Moore. Let me just, just touch quickly on a couple of things. First, um, the budget and homelessness. Um, the Chief will tell you a lot of the constraints and challenges that the police department has in dealing with um, your uh, requests for service around homelessness. Uh, and there are a lot of legal constraints, there are a lot of other practical constraints. But there's a lot more that we can be doing and that we're working on doing. For example, um, we're funding an increasing number of HOPE teams, and the Chief will talk about that. These are teams that involve the, uh, police officers as well as others, uh, employees in the city, sanitation employees and others, to go and deal with encampments and do the kind of outreach that we need to be doing to both for the people who need help and are willing to uh, get services, but also for those who are not interested in that, sometimes they need to be dealt with in a different way. And so the police are put into this very difficult position of having to sort that out. Um, 
we're trying to increase the number of HOPE teams that we have available to be able to, um, to re respond to some of those needs. Similarly, we have rapid response teams that go around um, and take care of bulky items that are taken in by homeless people, people sleeping on a couch on a sidewalk, people who are blocking a sidewalk with a, a tent that's illegally set up and so on. We're funding more of those teams so that we can deal more quickly when that situation comes up before it can start to, to fester into a, um, a larger encampment problem. We don't have nearly enough of those in the Valley. And this year's budget, um, one of the things that I'm especially going to press for is to significantly increase that investment so that they have more tools available to them to be able to address some of those problem areas. But at the same time, folks, we're going to have to do more to make sure that we shelter the homeless. And I'm going to tell you that right now. Law enforcement is not the only solution to this problem. So we're going to be investing in permanent supportive housing. We're going to be investing in bridge housing. We're going to be doing what we can to increase the stock of affordable housing in this city uh, because the police provide a temporary solution. The real solution to homelessness is making sure that people have better job opportunities, more housing opportunities, treatment for their drug and alcohol problems, uh, treatment for their mental health problems. Those are the solutions to homelessness. And we're going to continue to be very aggressive about pursuing those issues as well. On traffic safety, um, in the San Fernando Valley, I think my statistics are pretty close to right on this, Chief. Um, in the Valley, we lose as many lives to traffic collisions as we do to homicide. Uh, and it's, uh, it's, it's very close. Uh, sometimes it's a little more, sometimes it's a little less. And I always feel that to the grieving family who loses um, a child to a hit and run collision, or even not a hit and run collision, whose who, who child is killed by a driver, um, that family grieves just the same extent as the family who grieves because their child was killed by a, you know, a gangbanger. And so that is a huge priority for me to reduce the number of deaths. We've, the mayor and the council have adopted a vision zero goal that um, we will eliminate um, traffic deaths in this city. Um, some people emphasize engineering and issues around that, which is important, but law enforcement is another important part of that and making sure that drivers don't do the foolish things that they do uh, on our streets, don't speed, don't act recklessly. That's also how we save lives and that's squarely within the uh, responsibility of the police department. We're gonna continue to support them in doing that. So, um, I, I, I could go on, but you're here to hear from the chief, not from me. So um, let me just say this. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, this issue of public safety is, uh, while it's easy to ask the chief, chief, how come you haven't solved this problem, or how come you're not doing this? I think it's important whenever we have a discussion like this for us all to remember that our safety as a community depends on all of us. Uh, we have an extraordinary police department in this city, I think the best in the nation. Um, but it's also really important that we all continue to commit our own efforts to support law enforcement as well. So your engagement in Neighborhood Watch and, and the other things that we've talked about is really important. And that's why I'm so glad that we have so many uh, of uh, the booths around the perimeter of the room here so that you'll have a chance to find out more how you can get involved, how you can help uh, to address crime as well because it's going to take all of us pitching in and doing that. And in the same, uh, by the same token, as we have this discussion tonight, um, in order to make sure that this is a, as efficient and as productive as possible, um, I just ask that everybody be respectful of different views. Um, if somebody says something that you disagree with, um, that's okay. I mean, we can disagree. Um, we're all concerned citizens who care about the best interests of our community. So let's keep that mindset as we move forward. When it comes to questions after the chief speaks, um, We've got over 100 questions that have been submitted by constituents uh, for this event. We're not going to probably get through 100 questions. But the good news is that many of them are quite repetitive. 
so I'm going to be able to get through most of the subject matters, at least, I think, before we finish. And the reason I'm doing that is so that we can summarize them, so we can consolidate them, and also so that we don't get into a whole back and forth of somebody making a speech and taking up everybody else's you know, time that they have to ask questions. So I think that's what works most efficiently as we go through this. Uh, but as I say, if you have a question that doesn't get answered, submit it we'll get you an answer. Uh, every single question will be answered um, by us. So uh, with that, I'm gonna now uh, take uh, the opportunity to introduce you uh, to our chief of the Los Angeles Police Department. Uh, chief Michael Moore has been with the Los Angeles Police Department for 36 years. Um, he was born in Porterville, California, moved uh, around the country a little bit to various parts of the country before he came back here in 1978 and joined the Los Angeles Police Department three years later in 1981. Uh, Chief Moore rose through the ranks as police officer, detective, sergeant, lieutenant. He's worked patrol, investigative, and administrative assignments all over the city. Um, but many of us remember him well from his time uh, when he was a commander and and his assignment included operations of Valley Bureau, um, where he was pretty much running the Valley. And that was, uh, so he knows our issues, he cares about our issues, he cares about our communities. He was promoted to deputy chief uh, in charge of LAPD's West Bureau, serving the West Side in 2004. Um, and uh, then he returned here to the Valley as deputy chief, uh, where he served until uh, 2010. So when um, Mayor Garcetti was considering who the next chief would be to replace Chief Beck, um, he narrowed it down to a few candidates, all of whom I had the chance to, to talk with before the selection was made, um, and they were all three terrific candidates. Um, but I know Chief Moore well. I've known Chief Moore for many years. Um, I knew that he would be uh, the person that we needed to lead this uh, department into the future. Um, but just to make sure, a few of the things that we talked about before uh, he came before the council for, um, for our uh, approval was uh, the issues that I talked about. How Los Angeles Police Department will address, address homelessness in the valley, how we will increase patrol throughout the valley, um, and how we'll address traffic safety issues with the resources that we have. Um, and he was spot on on every one of those issues, and I'm sure you're gonna find so as well. So um, it's my great pleasure to introduce to you Chief Michael Moore. Chief. Whichever you'd like. So uh, what is your preference, the fireside or the, or the podium? Any, uh, any difference? I think we'll do fireside. You can just imagine those crickling. Uh... Well, good evening, everyone. And it's good to see a lot of familiar faces. And there's others out there, I must admit, uh, that uh, a senior moment, I probably know you, and you probably know me, but I have forgotten. So my apologies. But uh, Mike Moore, and to, it is good to be back here in North Hollywood at Valley College. Uh, this is a, uh, it's kind of, this 25 year uh, mark here is remembering where I was, if you will, tonight. And I was in this valley, I was a sergeant at the time, and working uh, in a position at crime analysis in downtown. And we, of course, the department got mobilized. My home was in Santa Clarita, uh, turned upside down. And, and uh, but I remember being detailed out here to the San Fernando Valley uh, and first thing we were doing was trying to dig into the stations because inside each of our stations uh, was this thing called a computer. And there wasn't a whole lot of them at the time, but we had a crime analysis function that actually had a mapping function, the ability to put a map on a computer screen. Amazing. And if you, uh, if you had your uh, information correct, you could actually take an Excel spreadsheet and you could log into an Excel spreadsheet and it would actually visually display where marks are on that map. And the uh, interesting thing is, I was just thinking back, is that uh, as a department, we actually produced within about uh, 36 hours the first set of maps in Los Angeles 
throughout, for the entire city of where all the, the uh, destruction was, where the red tags, yellow tags, and green tags. And we began uh, mapping those for the next two weeks. And I'm just, I look back on that and just think about uh, where we're at with technology today and just a short 25 years ago where we were. And you know, much of Los Angeles is like that. Uh, I want to take a moment and thank uh, Councilman Concordian for inviting me out here today. I also want to thank you for your leadership on budget and finance and as a member of one of the seven councilmen here in the San Fernando Valley. Uh, you're right, I have uh, spent a, a great deal of my career uh, here in the Valley in various capacities. I was a, I was a vice officer, an undercover officer working Van Nuys in the, uh, in the mid, um, 87, 86, 87, worked North Hollywood as a homicide detective in the late 80s, Foothill as a sergeant in the late 80s, early 90s, uh, and, and then came back here uh, later in the, in about a decade ago, a little over that now, and uh, spent five years as a deputy chief where we had fires, floods, we didn't ha have any locusts, uh, so uh, we, this is a valley that still has not had that challenge, but it has it experienced many other difficulties. And I do enjoy some of the faces around here because we've seen each other on some of these various challenges. Uh, tonight, it is a pleasure to be here to join with you in a talk about public safety uh, from a footing of that, that looking back, uh, I'm a person that as a chief going forward, uh, value the time that I've had growing up in this valley uh, as a member of, my org of this organization, uh, as both a line level as well as a senior command officer. Uh, and when I was given the opportunity to be the chief uh, by Mayor Eric Garcetti and the Board of Police Commissioners, I remarked on my experience here in the Valley and my commitment that moving forward I would be a chief for the entire city of Los Angeles. And that my experience was not just centered in one portion, it wasn't just centered in the valley or any more than it was just centered in South Los Angeles. I've worked in each of the, in the corners, but that I did believe that as a, 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 an applicant, as a candidate for this, that my experience here, uh, recognizing the seven commands under the leadership of Deputy Chief Chris Pitcher, and Chris, would you please stand? Please give this man a hand. <laughs> He's joined here tonight by Captain Phil Hearns from Van Nuys area. <laughs> Captain David Grimes from Foothill. <laughs> Captain Brian Windling. <laughs> Captain Donnie Graham from North Hollywood. Craig, Craig, <laughs> Craig Zanavuela. Uh, this is your Foothill Van Nuys North Hollywood team and obviously all under the leadership of, of Captain Pitcher, but um, as I'm here tonight with them and with the senior leads and members of, of the problem solvers that work in these, these, these two primary, uh, these three commands, uh, I, I look forward to an opportunity to talk about uh, where we're at, where we're going, both as a city as well as here in the San Fernando Valley and more specifically into Councilman Kukorian's district. Uh, and also, uh, and most importantly, hear from you and answer your specific concerns but, and then also talk about uh, challenges and, and opportunities that we have. The councilman is absolutely correct. Uh, this is a city that has made tremendous strides um, uh, from the rubbles of, of the earthquake, but also from the terrible times of the 90s with uh, the crack epidemic, uh, the violence that we saw. Uh, in 1992, this city experienced uh, over 1,100 homicides. This last year, in 2018, uh, that number was 259. We have had less than 600, or we've had less than 300 homicides for the last eight years. Uh, this last year, we also saw a reduction in a number of shooting victims. And while we still had 1,000 shooting victims uh, in the city, that's more than 160 fewer shooting victims than just two years ago. So year after year, there's been a decline in violence. And for the first time in a number of about three years, four years, we've seen a reduction also, not only in violent crime, but in property crime. And actually the Valley uh, led the city in that, in that issue, in the sense of its ability to reduce both violent and property crime overall. The city of Los Angeles uh, ended 2018 with a 3% reduction in violent crime, and with a 2% reduction in overall crime. That's 2,600 fewer crime victims in 2018 than 2017. Uh, and so we, um, we were happy with those numbers, but we also recognized that even with those numbers, that we've had hot spots, 
We've had issues where some, not all parts of the city have experienced uh, similar reductions. Uh, and we still have too much violence. When you look at 259 lives that were lost uh, to, uh, at the hands of another individual, 55% uh, of them were still by gang violence. This is an issue that was particularly seen this year in North Hollywood on the northern end of it. While North Hollywood had nine homicides versus seven the year before, a remarkably small number when you look at the size of North Hollywood versus other parts of the city, uh, the impact of gang violence, particularly in its shooting victims, which increased, was pronounced. Now I'm proud of North Hollywood and its men and women and the community because they've solved many of those crimes and they've identified and brought uh, to the justice system uh, those offenders. There was a murder just a few days ago in which the young man was, was shot and killed and, and, and at, at a nearby park. Within 24 hours, the offender was identified and arrested. Uh, that is your police department at work. That is your police department working with your neighborhoods, working with uh, all of our partners and identifying quickly. But at, the, but at the end of the day, we still have a loss of a life and we have an in a neighborhood that is terrorized by seeing that type of violence. Uh, so our work here is a, I won't say a tale of two cities, but it's a point of referencing that as a department, as a chief, in my role going forward is to look back and reflect upon my history and our experience and the 13,000 men and women of this organization and say, okay, what are the things that are working? And there's a lot of good things working. What are our challenges? Are we prioritizing them smartly? And are we ensuring that as we talk with our communities that we're speaking clearly that we will not solve every problem, that we must prioritize and that we will, and our commitment to you is that we're gonna work with you in a shared responsibility of public safety. That our work in here tonight, what you'll hear is as we talk about statistics, you know, that can be very annoying when your neighborhood You've got a, an incessant individual that drives up and down that street way too fast and gender, endangering you or your loved ones. Or you have a chronic location that seemingly always has people out front drinking and all times of night and day and, and, create, and creating havoc for your neighborhood. When you feel like you can't walk to a store because you're going to be accosted by an individual. Me telling you that we've had these reductions, that we're at 50 year lows in the number of homicides, that, ho that North Hollywood had 33 shooting victims last year, and while that's an increase, the city of Los Angeles had 1,000. So it's a small proportionality. Again, I recognize uh, as a resident of the city that I appreciate all that, but government talking to me needs to tell me how it's gonna help my problem, and it's gonna help me today. So here tonight, I'm here to talk about that, and I wanna talk about your specific questions, concerns. But before I do that, let me just finish my, my, my discussion here by pointing out a couple points. What you can expect from the Los Angeles Police Department is that what we just completed in this last year is that we're gonna continue those strategies and strengthen and do everything we can to improve their, their impact on public safety. The strategies that are helping us get to the point that we're here today uh, in the last three years has been moving people back to the field. We have moved more than 350 line personnel back to geographic areas. Now that has come at a cost because we have also shut down desk services at, at from 11 o'clock at night till seven in the morning in 16 stations. But that has allowed us to put 50 officers on the street. And what we have also done is downsized or eliminated some of our specialized posts, but what it has allowed us to do is put a more, you'll hear at, the, at our press conference, but you'll hear now, is that in 2018, we had more than one million hours of more patrol services in the streets of Los Angeles than we did two years ago with the same size workforce. So we are, in the last two years, been engaging in shifting our organization so that we are putting as many of our police officers in the street to work not just calls for service, but to work problems and challenges. We had in the last two years have shifted uh, over or nearly 100 officers in our HOPE teams and our Skid Row and Hollywood Entertainment and Venice Beach details, augmenting our patrols and our outreach and engagement with people who are experiencing homelessness. 
The point there is we didn't add 100 more police officers. We took officers that were in different parts of the organization and we've reprioritized them. It's what you do. And, the, and when you have a challenge, you have to, you have to work within your budget. Uh, calamity happens, a new challenge is on board. You look at what you have and say, what are we going to do, do differently? And that's what uh, the strategy that under Chief Beck, I'm proud to, uh, to follow that man. He did a tremendous job uh, for, for LAPD, his eight years as chief, eight plus years. I think he moved us forward and, and I know that he left this agency uh, um, in a much better place and he gave me a, a tremendous organization that I'm, I'm, uh, I'm thrilled to have an opportunity to, to follow uh, his, in his footsteps. Um, and the strategy of realignment was important. The strategy of the, and the commitment by the council to hire additional civilians has also been critical. Because a portion of, their, uh, of every person in the last two years that they've hired, they've asked us to identify the police officer that's going to go back to the field. This is last year, there are 41 officers that are in the field today because they hired and, and uh, allowed us to hire civilians that, to do an auditing or an inspection function that previously police officers were doing. Tomorrow, 36 detention officers will graduate uh, from the academy and enter the work at Custody Services Division, which is going to allow us to bring police officers who are assigned there out of those positions back into the field. The point of this is, is that our commitment going into 2019 is to continue to try and to identify every means of identifying civilians and identifying uh, personnel that can be freed up so that we can put and staff police officer positions first and our area stations first. On Sunday, the, the latest leg and will be 200 police officers from specialized positions, uh, including Metropolitan Division, will be reassigned back to geographic areas. So over the last three years, as of this Sunday, we will have realigned more than 550 people from a workforce of 10,000 to the geographic areas. So I know that on your uh, one of your primary concerns that has been and always will be in a city of this size and a department this small is are our police officers in our geographic areas and are they working in the field? And my commitment to you as an operations chief and my commitment to you now as chief is that we will staff patrol first. We will staff the geographic areas first and our commitment has been to cut and eliminate and downsize these other positions. Having said that, there are services which are going to be impacted. Just as we are now in the third day, going into the fourth day of the, LA, of the UTLA strike, we have mobilized our department in a sense that we have pulled every detective from specialized detectives out to, so that they can be at 369 elementary schools at least twice a day. So we are working within our existing resources and that's an agent, this is what you can expect from us going forward. Moving forward, we will identify where problems are occurring, where our challenges are, where our hot spots of, of crime and, and public disorder, and we'll work with the resources we have to try to put as many of those there that we can. Secondly, I'd like for our volunteers to please stand because this is also another important leg that we started in two, uh, this last year and we're now continuing into 2019. Could I have the volunteer members of the Los Angeles Police Department please stand? And my commitment with, uh, with Chief, with, the, uh, with Mayor Garcetti and with the Board of Police Commissioners, I talk about uh, community engagement and volunteer engagement. As the City of Los Angeles, we started this last year and we're going to continue under the leadership of Assistant Chief Gramala and with the support and leadership of our Bureau Chiefs and Area Captains with expanding the role and number of individuals that we have in our volunteer engagements. If you were to look at LA Sheriff's Department, you walk into the Hall of Justice, you would be surrounded by volunteers. The vast majority of personnel that work uh, in many of their positions are volunteer positions. They're generous, good, solid uh, citizens who come forward and want to add, give something back. And in Los Angeles, I, we saw that this last year. It's like, we don't have, we don't seemingly, we've not really marshaled that. So moving forward this last year, we set up a program of training. We worked with our council people, our area stations, and with our communities and said, would you be interested 
if we were to provide the amount of training, ensure that you uh, had access to vehicles for street patrols, that you stayed in your car uh, and talked on a radio, had good supervision, uh, but would you be willing to, to be eyes and ears for us and be a force multiplier? And I want to thank Chris uh, Pitcher again and the leadership of the Valley because they have led the way in Los Angeles with taking that idea and putting it on steroids. And so uh, going into 2019, if you're not a volunteer, I'm asking you to consider. If you're an adult, if uh, you've got a decent driving record. <laughs> <laughs> but if you have a desire to see, uh, to work at a desk, to call back victims, uh, to help us with, with administrative tasks that once you get behind the counter, you'll find a police officer often doing. Uh, we have a job for you. Uh, we have a role for you. Uh, it can be a few hours a week or it can be more than that. But it's a role and, a, and an effort of a shared responsibility of you helping us take on a task that's going to improve public safety. And it's going to help us do a better job and it's going to put more officers in the field. Uh, so community engagement has been in the past, roll calls in the street, you've seen Neighborhood Watch, you've seen our efforts of, of partnering with you, but I'm also asking you now to join us. And I, what our goal is to have as many as 5,000 volunteers. And that may sound like a lot, but in 21 stations across the city of Los Angeles, it's not all that many. In a city of 4 million. And I know in the Valley, which is known for its volunteerism, this is one of your, this is a core uh, value of, uh, of people who, in, who live in the Valley, that there's an opportunity here for you and, and we welcome you that. And for us, it's a strategy to help us communicate, build trust, for you to go back and talk with communities in which you live and work about what LAPD is efforting to do, what our limitations are, what our strengths and what our weaknesses are. And it's also a, a bit of candor of get, helping us identify how do we do our work better. So we've got community engagement. We're talking about uh, trust and clear communications. We're talking about putting more police officers in the field, uh, realigning our resources. Uh, a couple other areas in them uh, I'll talk about uh, this issue of this humanitarian crisis called homelessness. A couple of the strategies that we're moving forward on is we're, looking to, we're going to modernize our, modernize our technology. That computer I talked about from 1994, I hate to tell you this, but we are still taking reports the same way we did in 1994. Uh, if, if, uh, we have computers, the, the, the average age uh, is eight years of age. Uh, if, your phone was, as your, if your phone is two years old, you probably are, are, are frustrated with it, and it's probably not even with you tonight. Uh, but but we, have, uh, we have struggled, uh, the city of our size and the complexity of, of, of how big our IT structure is to, to keep our, our our technology modern. Uh, we have also uh, struggled with modernizing the way we take reports, 400,000 reports a year, and we type them. Uh, but yet we have body-worn video that gives us HD video, and officers go back and they literally right now are watching a video to type their report. So we're going to, in the next six months, uh, modernize our, our desks, our, our, uh, our station houses, report writing rooms. We've been able, with the generosity of the Council to get a, an earmark of money that's going to allow us to start uh, uh, modernizing our desktops to upgrade them to today's standards to improve the network speed. And we also have been working with the private uh, philanthropic community and have raised monies. Our target is to raise through the uh, memorial, uh, through, sorry, through the police foundation, $35 million for a five year bill. But they've already, a number of found supporters have already stepped forward to provide monies that's going to allow where the first step out of the gate is to visit our 21 stations and to modernize our report writing rooms, to upgrade the computers that are there, upgrade the network so that officers can get in, get out, and get back out in the field and not be frustrated uh, by a machine that freezes up when they try to download their, their digital video on their, on their body-worn video. So that's, the, that's one step. The next step this year is we look to modernize the way we even take reports. Some reports you're going to find, we're going to be shifting online. Uh, in my appointment uh, in July of this year, we moved theft investigations that have no investigative follow-up to an online report. We now are capturing one to 200 reports a week that are now taken online so the citizen can just simply submit it that they left their phone on a table 
at Starbucks so they could hold their seat, went to the bathroom, <laughs> came back. They had neither their seat nor the phone. <laughs> and, you know, I, it's a great way of preventing that theft. You know, you could just take the seat with you, and that way you... Uh, <laughs> But the, uh, you know, but the, the reality of the matter is, is that previously we would require that, uh, that individual to go to a station, wait in line, uh, probably get a little frustrated and, and take a written report or require an officer to go meet that individual to take that report. And that report went to the insurance company. It, it absolutely, there was little or no investigative value. How many of you know your serial number on your phone? I'm sorry if you do. No, so, you know. <laughs> but you know, you, if you have a great means, I, we do need you to know that. But most of us don't, and they know the phone number on the phone, and that. But that doesn't help us find the phone. And so the point of that is that, that we took hundreds and thousands of those reports. We take twenty thousand hit and run investigations a year, with no investigative follow up. Somebody, you come out to your to the parking lot. Somebody has dinged your rearview mirror or or scraped your fender and there is no investigative follow-up, and we require you to go to a station or we require an officer to go to see you to take a report that takes on average two and a half hours to complete. So we're looking to move those reports so that we can record and document crime in instances such as that, not to minimize it, but to ensure that we're spending our time on the most important functions and activities as police officers. So we're gonna shift these, some of these things online. Secondly, is we're going to, we'll be modernizing the officer's ability to actually take a report via tablets and, and via electronic means. So those are things that are going forward to improve the officer's workload, to improve your experience with LAPD. When you experience a crime or you have a, a, a challenging circumstance, uh, and, and those are the strategies in addition to our efforts with our youth programs to expand and also to build uh, additional community safety partnerships which are, uh, are small neighborhood groups of officers that work into dedicated neighborhoods. The San Fernando Valley will be the next target of that. It's a group that will be in the San Fernando Gardens. We're working with the Housing Authority now to open that in 2019. Uh, those officers will be dedicated to that area, not to police it, but to build lasting relationships with the community because in the six other areas that we've done that, Nickerson Garden, Harper Square, uh, Jordan Downs, uh, these locations have seen more than a 50% reduction in violent crime and, and there's substantial increase in the trust of the police. So those are some of the things that are in front of us. We have a full plate. Uh, we have uh, longer range goals as well relative to looking towards the 2028 Olympics and what does this organization look like as we move into the next decade. But lastly, and then we'll, we'll start with questions and answers if we could, is as much as I wax on about our great work and there is a much that's done that is, that is phenomenal. When instances happen, I have every confidence that our men and women working with you and working with our partners uh, can solve crime and can identify and bring offenders. I, have, I know that your efforts in prevention matter and that you uh, work collectively in sharing information to improve the safety of our neighborhoods. But in and amongst all this, we are experiencing the largest humanitarian crisis of our generation and nobody can leave this room and go for more than a mile without witnessing it. And that is the is issues of homelessness and the people experiencing homelessness, the 16,000 kids in Los Angeles last night that slept without shelter uh, of, a, of a population of 50,000 plus in LA County. The, uh, the 94 earthquake is often referenced as a, as a startling point of, re of recognition. Uh, 54 people died in the, in the North earthquake. Uh, 809 people died homeless last year in LA County. Uh, so, uh, in scale of magnitude, uh, the crisis that we have before us is, is absolutely extreme. I'm proud of you and myself that uh, we voted for some right measures. In this last year, I, I am seeing evidence of additional services coming on board. Two years ago, we were asked as a department uh, to develop strategies, and the department came out with developing its HOPE strategies, its homeless outreach and engagement. And we said, we need more sanitation services. And we've got to have more housing. 
and we need more storage for, for excess property. And the council and LA County has, has responded and we're building. I will say we're not building fast enough and I don't think anyone's satisfied with the pace. But this last year, what we saw with people experiencing homelessness is we have seen an increase in volatility. It's a very at-risk group. Very, it's a people, you can't just describe it in one, one just definition. People living in cars are different, are, have a different makeup demographically than perhaps people living um, alongside a freeway embankment or in an alley or, or in some other uh, makeshift. But, but in that group is a very unstable group and we saw an increase in violence. Portion of that uh, was we think better uh, us a better awareness of the role of homelessness of people who are either sh uh, injured by violence or suffer some type of, of, of grievous injury or are an offender. But there is also a portion where it's a very it's a very uh, very unstable, very at risk group. Our officers have been very effective in working with that population, meaning in identifying those that are criminally involved. However, they've also been, they are also limited uh, today versus say 10 years ago with levers of impacting a population that many of them may be suffering from mental illness, but also many are suffering from chronic addiction to narcotics. And simply uh, looking towards an officer to say, well, why aren't you taking this person away? This person's a drug user today the levers are not the same as they were a decade ago. And so officers uh, will take action and can enforce, but to you as a community member, uh, your frustration we share is that what we're unable to do is get the person out of the cycle of returning right back to the street and returning right back to becoming a narcotic user. Today, that cycle is much shorter because the nature of the offense is it's a citation at the scene, or at best an arrest and a release. There's not a, there's not a two day or three day or, or some period of time which the person is removed from, from your community. So our officers are challenged there. Uh, however, the reality of this is that you have, I'm gonna ask you to recognize, is that we are not the solution to homelessness in the, in the San Fernando Valley, in the city of Los Angeles. And as chief, my commitment to this council person and to the mayor and to uh, my men and women is that homelessness is this humanitarian crisis that requires all of us collectively to work towards solutions. And historically, this city has not done that. When I look at graffiti and the impact of graffiti in Los Angeles in the 90s, uh, when I look at gang violence in the 80s and 90s, if I look at instances of other uh, challenges to the city. Historically, they've looked to the Los Angeles Police Department, city fathers have, to say, we need you to fix that. Remember Operation Hammer in the 80s, right? Three strikes, you're out. Uh, we used to have senior, uh, we have a couple of these guys have been around here a while. Any senior leads that ever painted out graffiti? There you go, see, you can say it, you can own it, all right? Well, no, I wasn't saying you're sentenced to it. <laughs> but, but for a period of time, when graffiti was just going rampant, we had, we had paint brigades of senior leads that would have paint outs with community members. And we marshaled policing to, to do paint outs. We marshaled police officers to go after gangs. And in reality, neither one of them solved the underlying problem. And in fact, both of them ended up getting in situations where the police officers were ultimately vilified by members of the community and said, why are you doing this? You're, you're punishing the wrong people. You're, you, you, we become on the wrong side of the equation. And today, it's the same with homelessness. We may have the ability, because the law says you can't sleep on a sidewalk, that to physically make the arrest. But I have court decisions and I have a community that if I physically ask my officers to go out and uh, enforce the law with such a rig rigor and such a rigidness, the trust of the community will turn against us because there are there is no other option for the person or place for the person to go. Now, that's why we need the housing. That's why we need sanitation services. Bridge housing 
offers us an opportunity to start establishing strategically in each of the 15 council districts locations with 50 to 100 beds that can say to Michael Moore, who's sleeping on a sidewalk and blocking an alley and in your area, there's a bed over here for you. And when Michael then says, I'm not interested in that bed, well, you need to move. You can't sleep here, you can't stay here, you, can't, you just can't squat here. You need to find, some, you have to go someplace else. You don't have the right just to choose here. Today, we're limited in that. If that person is blocking access to a business, we can, we can physically arrest them. And I ask my officers too, if the person is unwilling to move. If the person is blocking access in and out of the business, or blocking access, it's called uh, ADA access on a, on, on a pathway, then we want voluntary compliance. And we generally get it 99% of the time. And those instances in which we're not, we are making enforcement action. It's enforcement action of a misdemeanor it's a citation or perhaps a physical booking, the person is going to be released on his own recognizance. That is, the, that is the nature of the mechanism. But we can't exercise that. But what we really need is many more housing options and opportunities for, these, for individuals experiencing homeless to exercise and go to. So I'm gonna ask for your support in this district. This is a city that needs to grow up in its housing. It needs to recognize that people sleeping in a street, sleeping on a sidewalk, sleeping and, and or however circumstance they find them in, is far more dangerous to a community than a bridge house that has 24-7, 365 supervision, lighting, licensed professionals, security, and the site that is open in downtown Los Angeles, I welcome you to visit. In addition to that, your council has, has been uh, very generous with, uh, with finding the will and the ability and with very tight funding to augment staffing of policing around those locations. So today in downtown and El Pueblo, we have officers that patrol 24 hours a day on an augmented overtime basis to ensure that, that safety zone, if you will. Now, is everyone off the street in that zone? And I'll tell you no. But it has reduced the daytime camping, the daytime, to nearly zero. And the instances of individuals that are there, we work with, with LASA and with outreach workers, and we are beginning to find that they are finding their way to move to housing, to find shelters, or they're leaving the area. So I suspect that you'll see uh, there'll be fits and starts with this, but my commitment to you is that we, moving into 2019, is find ways of, supportive, of supporting housing, find ways of supporting additional beds for people that, that, so people can find a place to stay. Safe parking in this city is full, but I drive by empty parking lots. We have thousands of people who are living in vehicles. We need to find more ways for people to park those vehicles in safe locations. In California, we have a number of safe parking programs, and there is not a single one that has experienced some type of shantytown or, or chronic violence. And quite the contrary. They're safe, they're orderly, and the people are, are finding refuge there and, and act very responsibly. And it's a bridge, it's another step forward to stability and adding stability in their life. So those are, those are things that depending on, as you move around this city, there are varying levels. I was at uh, Sher the Sherman Oaks Homeowner Association a couple months ago, and, and this was a contentious tar uh, tar topic. And, and perhaps it can be the location chosen, but as a community, if we're not gonna go there, then where are we going to go? We, we cannot just kick the can. We need to find a way to house people and find alternatives to what we have today. Lastly, in regards to homelessness, we have invested a tremendous amount with uh, Los, Los, uh, LASA and Department of Mental Health to train our people so that our, our, our people have as much uh, of an understanding as possible as what alternatives are and strategies so we can effectively work and give people options. 
but we need many more outreach workers. The, the housing program, the uh, homeless program in Los Angeles at three in the morning cannot be LA Fire and LAPD. Today, it re largely remains LA Fire and LAPD. I'm encouraged by, uh, uh, by P uh, Peter Lynn and his, and his work to grow that, by the city to add outreach workers from a community. I just ask you to continue to ask the county for the numbers. We need to invest in more and more outreach workers where we have outreach workers who are literally roaming the streets 24 seven, looking for opportunities to form relationships with people who are in a point of crisis to find options out. That kind of compassion, that type of engagement is, is going to prove results, it already has, and it's gonna allow our men and women to work on people who are truly criminal offenders and are preying upon others and not experiencing the worst crisis of their life. Lastly, sanitation, uh, storage. People today are living, 50,000 people in the street. They don't, have, they don't have latrines, they don't have laundry, they don't have showers, and they certainly don't have trash receptacles <coughs> sufficient, that we, and we need more. And I, I appreciate and applaud sanitation, uh, uh, public works has, I, I believe, probably doubled their resources. Uh, more is needed, and I know the council knows that, and I know that the city, the mayor invested over, and the city invested over $100 million last year in, in added homeless services and, and resources, but we've got we've to add more, because when sanitation can clean areas around the city, and trash and debris and mattresses and, and large bulky items are not allowed to just sit there, then people have a better sense of control of those neighborhoods and of and a safety in which they live. And those are going to, again, help our officers focus on the true underlying issues of crime and, and disorder and who's creating it uh, and not be bogged down by, what are you doing about this encampment? There's nobody there and why isn't the police department taking it away? We're governed by the law that doesn't allow us many times to take that away because it's a seizure. And police officers are seizing things. Sanitation workers are doing cleanup. It's just kind of the nature of roles. It may sound kind of technical, but as a department, we have gotten ourselves into court orders and under decrees that us going to places that have no one there and just taking and seizing materials is like a police officer taking your car from the front of your house. Did you have notice? Were you given advice, advance warning? Well then how did you just seize it without a warrant? So those are some of the challenges we have, uh, but with that, I wanna say that you have, I hope, a confidence in a department that we are an, an organization that has been born and bred, committed to the people of this city to make a difference. And I don't say that from some hokey fashion because I know the dedication that the men and women of this organization have. And we get tired and frustrated and can be a bit peeved about this seemingly is not going anywhere. But we're gonna come back right back with you to try to work and try to solve problems. As a chief, I'm here to, to tell their story, to, to brag about it, to see when there's areas that we could do better. Uh, but and my commitment to you is to be a partner, uh, that we work together for a safer Los Angeles and for a time where I'm, I have every confidence in the future we can we can turn a corner on this issue of homelessness. Uh, but we've, we, now is not the time to let off. Now is the time to double down, keep pressing, keep, keep asking, get more housing, uh, get more sanitation, and get more outreach workers that will make a difference in the lives of these people and will make a difference in our communities. So thank you and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Bert. There we go. Thank you very much, Chief. Um, thanks for that overview. And, and I think in the course of the questions, we'll get into some of the issues that you've already uh, touched upon in a little uh, greater depth. Um, I want to start with a category of questions that we got a lot about. Um, and it dealt with the interface between the public and the police department, how, uh, how they contact the police department and how the police department responds. Um, so, uh, 
one question was, when do I call 911? When do I call 877-ASK-LAPD? When do I call my local police station? And related to that was another question, um, if I'm a witness to a drug sale in my neighborhood, what, if any, action should I take? So maybe you could give an overview of, of okay. what's the differentiation yeah. there. So 911 is an emergency. So if you have a, a violent crime in progress, uh, if somebody has just attacked you and, and you're injured and and you want to call us. Uh, if you have uh, a serious crime that just occurred, that's a 911 call. If you have a um, party that's nearby, uh, somebody is not an immediate peril to you, but you need the police to come out. You have a dispute that is involving a neighborhood kid. Uh, that's an 877 number. That's a non-emergency number, and it will give a uh, go to a dispatcher, uh, communications, and they will dispatch a call. I will tell you that too many times, uh, and then lastly, the station. Do not call the station to have a unit come out to your house. Our front desk stations are handling a lot of calls. Um, what are the zoo hours and all kinds of natures and questions, but, but the bottom line is there's a couple officers typically staffed there and they will handle uh, report calls as people walk in to, to take counter reports. If you are calling there, it should be about a point of information about contacting your senior lead or if you have a question or, con or complaint about police service, you want to talk to a supervisor. Limit police calls to the station to those non-emergency and in instances and instances in which you want to talk with your local station about a problem or about a situation that you that's not something happening right now or you, or you expect an officer to come out. Recognize that in an effort to optimize our, de our desk services that we have phone trees now in our stations and you may go to voicemail. Uh, North Hollywood and other commands uh, go through those voicemails in North Hollywood, Captain Graham, was, his remarks were that they go through those voicemails every three hours to call people back. So if you call there and you're looking for a police officer to come out to your house, you may not have someone monitor that number for, for a couple hours. So, that's, so don't call the stations. 877, you will call there, and, I, and I'm, we're trying to make this better, we're trying to improve this, but our service times on 877, you may have a wait time. Uh, versus a 911 call. We try to answer all 911 calls within 90% of them within 10 seconds. We answer about 80% right now within 10 seconds. But what happens is people, I know that you're going to find this hard to believe, but they're impatient. So they call 911. It's not really an emergency, but they know someone will answer the phone. Whereas they call 877, they're going to have to wait on the phone for an operator to come up. If you call 911, the first question is going to be what? What's your emergency? I don't have an emergency. Uh, please hold. <laughs> you go to the 877 number. Um, so just that's what I'd encourage you. 877, non-emergency, uh, 911 emergency. How many of you have your senior lead emails in your, thank you, all those hands should go up. Those are really also valuable for, for giving them an email, giving them a message, recognizing they have days off, they actually go home at night. Uh, end day, uh, so, but give them time to work with you on neighborhood problems as well. <laughs> Thank you, and you anticipated uh, one of the next questions, Chief, which has to do with calling the station. Someone had asked why are calls to North Hollywood Division going unanswered. That is precisely the reason, and, and um, in order to get that enhanced patrol presence that the Chief has prioritized, um, one of the trade-offs is uh, reducing the desk presence that um, our officers would otherwise have. So please don't use those numbers unless you're calling somebody specifically in the station for a specific reason. 877-ASK-LAPD. It's easy to remember. 877-ASK-LAPD. One thing I'd follow up on is though, when you do call us, uh, everybody who calls Mike Moore gets a phone call back. If you email me, you know, I, I get my emails and I expect that of every member of the organization. Uh, so with that, if you're calling for your senior lead or you email your senior lead or your captain, uh, I, our standard of service is that we will reach back to you. May not reach back to you today, but within a reasonable period of time, if you call me, you know, if you call my office tonight at, at six o'clock, I was on the road, so, but I will, I will call back tomorrow. Um, and I expect that of our service, and I think most of our people do that. 
But if you don't, that's why you know, God invented supervisors, is that uh, I want you to reach out to them so that they call you back and we make sure we address your concerns. Uh, and I apologize to you that if our people get busy and something gets, they get hung up, but like this week would be a perfect example. Most of our personnel were at station, or were at uh, schools throughout the city. Uh, but with that said, there still is an opportunity throughout the day at some point to get a list of those calls and reach back to the people who called and let them know you got your call and I want to do what I can when I get back, you know, as soon as the strike is over or if it's something more pressing than that, let's assign a radio unit to it and get some, somebody out there. That's the, my guarantee is, so, so if the calls don't get answered, that doesn't mean though that we don't care and it's just a dead end street. I want you to reach back to us, reach to one of our captains. They seemingly always have time and, uh, and they will, they'll make sure that the process is working. So Chief, we differentiated a little between 911 and non-emergency calls. So someone had asked, Okay, what is the average response time when I call in a non-emergency non request? And why does it take so long for LAPD to respond when I call about a home or a car break-in? Yeah. So the average, there's, we track three different numbers of response times. There's an emergency response, code three. There's a uh, urgent, what's called a code two. And then there's routine. The average time in the city of Los Angeles, uh, as of this last week, for emergency call for service was 5.9 minutes. Uh, so from the time you pick up your phone to call us to the time an officer is on scene, an emergency call, just under six minutes. In North Hollywood, that was uh, 6.2 minutes. For a urgent call, which is, uh, an urgent call is, some say you were just, uh, you were just robbed. Now, you can't rob a house, but let's say you, you're, someone broke into your house and they just left. And you called a suspect was just, just seen fleeing the residence. That would be a code two call. In Los Angeles, that number is about 19 minutes is the average. In North Hollywood, it was 18.6 minutes. So they're a little better than that. Now that means on average, uh, it's a median score, meaning that half of the time it's faster and half the time it's slower. That number has <coughs> used to be 15 to 16 minutes. Why we're shifting resources back to patrol is to try to move that number down. Ur uh, routine calls are non-emergency, so a crime's not in progress, a crime has not just occurred. It could be a neighbor dispute. Uh, somebody's parking their car in front of your house uh, for the incessant 15th time, 15th time, and uh, you've had a small dispute with them, a verbal dispute. Uh, but that routine call in the city, it's 47.7 minutes on average. So it could take nearly an hour for an officer to come by there in Hollywood. I'm sorry, North Hollywood is 54.2 minutes. We saw that about two months ago creep up to about 59 minutes citywide. In some areas were over an hour. Um, again, those 200 officers we're bringing back on Sunday is part of an effort to address that. We're, we've had 57,000 more radio calls this year in 2018 than we did in 2017. If you go back to 2012, we have more than 160,000 radio calls. We have over a million radio calls in 2018, first the year before, uh, a million radio calls this in 2018, 57,000 more than the year before, and about 850,000, 840,000 in 2012. The workforce is still 10,000, we haven't changed that. So our men and women are handling far many, far more radio calls today than they were. They're primarily, when you look at it, uh, people calling for suspicious activities like burglaries or prowlers or disturbances. Uh, and so this is why, again, we've shifted. You have seen emergency calls stay consistent. The goal for the city by the city council is seven minutes or less. Uh, but we, uh, but our routine and urgent calls have crept up. But let me also finish by this aspect and caution you about response times. In policing, response times have been demonstrated time and time again to serve one purpose, and that is your sense of safety. It has not proven to be effective in capturing suspects. And if you think about that, when you think about if you've been a victim of a crime, by the time you get your act together <laughs> to say, holy smokes, I gotta call somebody, 
and you get a hold of the operator and you get the description down, that offender, vast majority of time is gone. So studies have been done for the last 40 years because many agencies back in the 70s and 80s wanted to get that response time. And you'll hear Burbank talk about, we got a four minute response time. Okay, um, th that's good. But in reality, a four minute response time generally has not proven any more effective in capturing offenders leaving a scene than a seven or eight minute. So putting more police officers out there to get shorter response times has to be the driver of that is, is customer sentiment. What is your willingness to wait? Agencies across the country uh, have three and four hour response times to routine calls. Uh, it, because that's, that's their level of police service. Us as an agent, as a department, we've generally ranged between 40 to 60 minutes. So just let me make one uh, side note on that, um, and that's home burglaries in progress, which is, I know, a big emphasis of my captains uh, because they know that if they're able to identify and, and uh, catch a uh, one of these burglar crews, it's going to prevent a lot of future burglaries. Yep. And so it's not just catching them for that crime, it's also a crime prevention oh, thing because they're all, these are professionals on like car break-ins and some other things. Um, I think some people in, in uh, my district have um, been surprised by delays after an alarm yeah. is triggered in a home. Okay. And I think a lot of that is due to the alarm company itself and its verification process. Is that is that the case? So uh, first on an alarm does not mean you have a home invasion robbery. Uh, the home invasion, if your home and your home is broken into, that's a code three response. And you will have God in the world coming your way if they're available, <laughs> I mean if they're around because there's nothing more scary, and officers know that, that if you're home, doesn't matter who you are, somebody breaks in your home, we're gonna get everything we can coming towards you uh, to help you. Uh, so, however, that's different than your, uh, your ring alarm going off. Now, if your ring alarm shows a person kicking down the door you know, and going inside, whether you're home or not, that's going to be a code three response if we have that information. But most of the time, here in the San Fernando Valley, you've had, I have an alarm going off. That 98% of alarms or more are false alarms. They, they, they turn out to be an, an inoperable alarm or a windstorm or someone forgot to lock a door and a, a gust of wind opened it. They're not verified alarms. A verified alarm, at a minimum, is a code two response, if not code three. Dep it's a, depending on the circumstances, but a, a verified someone is breaking in this residence, and again, our officers, um, our officers like catching bad guys. You know, so there is, uh, you know, there is no, there's nothing slowing them down. Uh, if they know there's a, a person breaking into a home or in a, in a business, they're going to move uh, as as quickly and as lawfully and as safely as they can uh, there in an effort to capture the individual. In terms of uh, drug sales, Chief, someone had asked, if I'm a witness to a drug sale in my neighborhood, what action should I take? And I think often people in neighborhoods know where this yeah. is going on. They know the troublesome strip mall or the troublesome house where drug activity is going on. They may witness it in progress. What's, what are the steps that the public should take? So first of all, if you witness it in progress, do not stop it. Do not flash your lights, do not say, hey you, um, be a good witness, observe it, you know, um, take note of characteristics of the people involved. And the reason I say that is because that's not the first, nor will it be the last drug transaction that ever occurs, uh, but your involvement could jeopardize your safety. People who are dealing drugs, people who are using drugs are very unstable. So please, um, be a good witness. It isn't worth your direct involvement. Now having said that, that drug sale going on there, that drug transaction, is going to be a serial or pattern. It, and each of the stations that you have here tonight have narcotic enforcement details that conduct investigations on complaint of narcotic sales. So if you have a house or a business or a location where people are are hanging out, and I will tell you, street sales of narcotics today is down quite a bit because it's just the business is such that it's gone 
underground, telephone, call-ups. You can just call places. You can, you can act actually, now people will deliver cannabis to you. Uh, so there's a, it's a, the nature of the craft is changing. It's not the same drug alleys that we had in the past. But that's not to say that they don't exist. If you think you have at a park or an alley or a location that is allowing this drug location to go on, your narcotic enforcement detail at the station and your senior lead will work a problem-solving effort on that. Your bit of information is the starting point. Let them do the investigation. No surveillance is in here, right? No, don't, don't build a case, let us work it. Okay, thank you. We had many questions about staffing and you touched upon that a lot about the increase of commitment to geographical um, divisions that you've talked about. Um, just to drill down a little bit more on that, um, can you talk a little bit about the plans to add staff specifically uh, into the valley? And um, someone also asked, will there be an increase in the number of senior lead officers for areas such as the NoHo Arts District that have right. had significant increases in population? So the 200 personnel that are coming back to the geographic areas as of this Sunday were distributed across the 21 areas, including this, this, this bureau, uh, based on what equitably, meaning that we split it by, base, by workload. Uh, how many radio calls, uh, what's, the, what's the workload indicator show for North Hollywood, save or Central? I'll give you an example. Central has gone up somewhere in the area of like 25% in radio call traffic, um, primarily dealing with challenges of people experiencing homelessness. That's a disproportionate number compared to other parts of the city. So we took those 200, like we did to 350 before them, and they were parsed out based uh, on a on a equitable workload. You have seven commands here in the San Fernando Valley. The San Fernando Valley uh, received a portion. I don't have on the top of my head what proportion, but they got a they got a the the valley was added with officers. Uh, the last point is the senior leads. There's 168 senior leads in the city of Los Angeles. In 1988, there was 168 senior leads. <laughs> In the, in the Los Angeles Police Department. Uh, but I am thankful, uh, under leadership of, of Councilman Bonin, and I believe uh, Councilman Corrin, you seconded this, and formed a study that we're in the midst of analyzing our basic car plan, which is, basi is the, is the uh, uh, structure in which we staff patrol. And each of those cars has a senior lead, a district. The districts have changed enormously. If you if you think about just 20 years ago, where you know Playa de Vista was was underwater, uh, you know now people who own those homes are underwater. But you know it's it's the it's a tremendous uh, it's a great location. It's a wonderful location. But but no, NoHo NoHo's got you know tens of thousands more people downtown Los Angeles. So we're now doing a study that's going to come back to the council. It's going to come back to the department with uh, identifying. Are there sufficient numbers? How are we utilizing the resources that we have and recommendations as to additional ones or deploying them differently than what we have? All right, thank you. Now, um, there's a few questions specific to violent crime. Um, someone asked, according to the LA Times, violent crime is down across Los Angeles, but violent crime is up in North Hollywood Division. Why is that the case, and what is LAPD's strategy, strategy to reduce violent crime in the area? And then if I could just add on uh, someone else's question, specifically, what is LAPD doing to reduce and prevent gang activity in North Hollywood and Van Nuys? So Van Nuys actually saw a reduction in violent crime uh, in 2018. North Hollywood did see a small increase at 56 additional uh, violent crimes. Uh, primarily it was called, it's called an aggravated assault. This was a dispute between two individuals and, and involved of, you know, some type of, uh, of, of injury to, to the individual, sometimes serious. Uh, in looking uh, and talking with the North Hollywood and, and, and Valley Bureau Command as to their analysis of it. Uh, first of all, their arrests for those offenses are up. Uh, they have uh, br you know, brought the justice people who are engaged in that. The northern end of the division has seen uh, an increase in gang crime. Uh, it has involved a, a gang dispute with some gangs from the Van Nuys uh, section uh, adjoining uh, command. They're working with the Gang Reduction Youth Development uh, Intervention and Prevention uh, Initiatives to, 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 to quell 
this back and forth and this, this, uh, this, um, this, this pettiness of them going back and forth and attacking each other over, over mainly disrespect. Uh, and, they're, and, they're, and I believe that you'll see them be successful. I say that because historically this is the, these are the types of disputes involving these two commands that will spring up from time to time. And by working effectively with our interventionists and preventionists and not just thinking we're going to enforce our way out of it, uh, they're able to uh, strike a measure of responsibility and, and, and quell those concerns. However, there is a role for enforcement. I'm proud of the, the leadership within uh, these commands that, that are identifying those people who are on probation or parole. They're holding them accountable uh, with probation and parole searches or making arrests uh, when they're in violation and they're identifying people responsible for those crimes. So I'm, I'm, uh, I believe that you'll see a better 2019 uh, in North Hollywood for violence and I'm encouraged by the success that Van Nuys has had, uh, particularly when about nine months ago there was, a, a, uh, there was an increase that you saw in some gang violence that they were able to turn around. Great, thank you. Uh, let's turn now to um, homelessness. And uh, the first question involves uh, the, cat the subcategory of homelessness, people living in their vehicles. And you touched upon this earlier, the need for safe parking. Um, many folks here may not know that, was it six months ago now, about six, six months or so ago, um, we opened one of the first safe parking uh, programs right here in the area. Um, on uh, city-owned property and have not had one single complaint from anyone about it being up and running. It has not had a single problem, um, but it's filled with cars with people who would otherwise be living in their cars in your neighborhoods. And now they have a place where they, they are safe, they're not in your neighborhood, they have hygiene, um, and not a single problem. So we certainly do need more of that. but. We continue to have in neighborhoods throughout my district the problem of strings of beaten up RVs uh, with cardboard and things covering all the windows. And it continues to be um, a, a problem impacting a lot of neighborhoods. So what is LAPD doing in terms of policing the homeless dwelling ordinance? Yep. And um, how are, specifically the question also included, how are uh, we making sure that homeless living uh, in these RVs don't have firearms? Okay, so a couple of different questions in there. First of all, I think there's, I think the count was something like 8,000 of these vehicles across the city. It could be even more than that. But the challenge the city has had is if we impound the vehicle, uh, will the tow yards take the car? Because the, it's a heavy tow. It's got hazardous waste, and there's been efforts in the last year, year and a half, uh, to bolster the ability of, of tow yards uh, to actually inc uh, increase their, their ability to take custody of these, of these vehicles. Um, however, it's still a problem for our officers. They'll go to a location, and there's a vehicle that they're going to impound, and they may not be able to get a tow service, because I think there's, there's like two or three in the entire city that will come and take custody of that. So it's a, a bit of a dance of scheduling and getting that tow service to come and take and capture that vehicle. But before we get to that, uh, the nature of 85.202 of the LAMC is it's not a, it's a uh, administrative count. It's called a, uh, a, an ACE violation. The officer cites the individual, it's a $25 uh, violation, and there is no criminal offense if the if the offense continues. So the officer's abilities, uh, from an enforcement standpoint, are more limited uh, than than uh, than one than what you may wish. We do have the ability to tag that vehicle, and after 72 hours, if it doesn't move, to have it impounded. But again, then that's, and that's what our officers have practiced. Uh, they'll tag it in 72 hours, especially if the vehicle's in disrepair. It's still there. They can, they can call, as can DOT, uh, Department of Transportation, the parking checkers, and have that vehicle removed. The challenge has been the capacity to take that vehicle off the street. 
The other matter about citing the vehicle is sometimes the elements of people who are living in these vehicles have gotten smart and they won't come out or they won't identify themselves that they're in there. And that's where you've got a catch-22. And so the officer has no one to cite because there's nobody there and we don't have the ability to go inside. So it's a bit of a cat and mouse game. What we've asked our personnel to do and what we'll ask you to do is work with, uh, it's not a give up. I think we've got to go back and identify, go back to those scenes that if they decide to take over a block or you've got this person who's not moving that vehicle because it's in disrepair, is to be persistent. And you know, we may tag it and they may move across the street, but then we come back and we tag it again. And I believe at some point uh, I've seen uh, my own experience has seen people will move on. Uh, and if they don't and they get lazy and they don't move it after three days, is that we try to, to bring in an ability to come in and, and remove that vehicle so there is a consequence. The frustrating part for our people is historically if we had had a vehicle blocking a driveway, we could call for a tow and a tow would be there in about five to seven minutes. To pick up the car, it's gone. If you park your car on Ventura Boulevard <laughs> between the hours of what, four and seven? There'll be plenty of tow trucks around there waiting for you, right? Uh, but this is, a, uh, this is a, a vexing issue because the nature of these vehicles are such that they've uh, confounded, if you will, tow yards that take it and they go, now what do I do with this hazardous waste? Because it's the sewers are overflowing, it's filled with material that they have EPA challenges. So we continue to work on that. I look forward to, to Again, like I talk about sanitation, I think we need to build capacity, uh, and we need to build capacity for people who, for these vehicles that are broken down and uh, inoperable, so that they are, because they're a danger, they're a danger to people living in there. And let's not talk about firearms, let's just talk about open fires and so forth that are in those homes. People die as a result of carbon monoxide poisoning or the, the, the coach itself goes up. Lastly, this issue of firearms inside the coaches. We've not seen experiences of people inside these motorhomes. Uh, I'm not aware of uh, some rampant issue where they're, they're, they're loaded up with firearms. Our area stations, uh, if they were to identify a person who was there, uh, who was on parole or probation, uh, if they had some reason to believe that the person was armed with a handgun or a firearm uh, and was a prohibited possessor, we would act on that. We would seize that weapon. Uh, to date, that hasn't been the practice. That has not been the experience. If you have something different, if you know the person is armed, I will say this, if you know someone is armed, you see them with a handgun openly displaying it uh, in a motorhome or in a, in a vehicle on the street, uh, and you know, feel free to talk. I would ask you, that's not an emergency call, but you should talk with your senior lead, you should talk with a non-emergency number, because we should investigate uh, people who are openly displaying firearms uh, and in a, in a circumstance to understand uh, what is happening here? Is there a danger to that community? Thank you. Um, the next series of questions is, it deals with encampments, but before we get to it, I, you made the comparison earlier between the Northridge earthquake and homelessness that we experience now, and I think it was really apt. Um, on any given night in Los Angeles, we have uh, as many homeless people as could fit into Dodger Stadium on a sellout night. So envision that for yourself. And then think what the national response would be to Los Angeles if an earthquake put that many people out on the streets. If uh, housing, enough housing was destroyed by an earthquake to put 50,000 people on the streets, the National Guard would be here, FEMA would be here, they'd be investing billions of dollars on helping to fix this problem for Los Angeles. But because it was a human ca catastrophe instead of a natural disaster, we're sort of left to fend for ourselves in addressing this. So in that context, Chief, um, what is LAPD doing about, uh, I'm gonna sort of ask a group of them and you can answer them collectively. What is LAPD doing about the increasing number of encampments? How does LAPD police these encampments? Um, and uh, how are you dealing with uh, mentally ill and homeless individuals specifically around North Hollywood Park and in other city parks uh, within the district? Um, also related to that, uh, what should local residents and business owners do when they encounter aggressive behavior in encampments? 
So what we're doing about the increase in homeless encampments, the increase of people experiencing mental illness uh, who are experiencing homelessness, the impact they're having on neighborhoods is that we are a member of the Unified Homeless Resource Center, uh, the response center that's out of the, the city's emergency operations center. Uh, it is a uh, shared responsibility of city and county partners that are identifying where encampments are, what including sanitation and other city services and county services, and what are what are our responses, and what are the response the results. So we've handled we've uh, this is under the mayor uh, Garcetti's leadership about five months ago opened up this, if you will, like this this emergency command center uh, to begin tracking, cataloging, and 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 organizing a response. But I will tell you this, it is not an LAPD response. It, this is a all of, all of, of a whole community response. And we need to continue to focus that fire is there. Fire, uh, Chief, thanks for being here tonight. Appreciate your, uh, appreciate your participation. I know it's busy out there for you. Uh, can you guys give uh, Chief Drake a hand, please? <laughs> Uh, but you know, fire and police department are constantly saying, what are you doing about these, what are you doing about these, these various encampments and these various challenges? And what we've done is we've said, we will bring our organizing skills, we know how to organize, uh, and, but we're gonna bring it to, with LASA, DMH, sanitation, pub, other elements of public works, and let's talk about what we're going to do, about what all of us are going to do. This is a shared responsibility. That has to be the recurring tone. When you're looking to a police officer to solve homelessness, you're, you're, it's like looking to, I mean, I'm trying to think of another analogy. We are the wrong tool. We are, the wrong, we are, we didn't, we are not, we are not going to enforce our way out of this. We need to identify those that are cr criminally involved, that are preying upon others, and we are doing that and are committed to doing that. But we cannot criminalize people who have no place to go. And, and or or are suffering mental illness and needs services and need housing. If you have a family member, if there's any NAMI uh, members in here, but if you have a family member who's experiencing acute mental illness, I mean, as Americans, as I mean, I'm embarrassed. We have some of the best health care in the world, but to get in care. Um, uh, services for a person who is a danger to themselves or suffering from acute mental illness is is just a, is such a high hurdle, and and we've got to change that. Absolutely right. When people ask about why we have so much homelessness here, there's many reasons, but one of the reasons is that for the last half century, this country and this state in particular has essentially abandoned its responsibility to care for people who are suffering from mental illness. Yes. And, and now we're reaping the, and, and here's the whirlwind what, and, as a And this result. is where my commitment as chief is, I'm not gonna fix that by saying LAPD is going to is going to address these things. Every time, that's a fool's errand. And, and by the way, historically, the, as an organization, I've seen the, this department uh, in this city going to riots because we think we're going to fix this and we end up losing the very trust and confidence and regard of the people in which we're trying to protect. So we're not, this time, we're, we're, we join with you and we're frustrated and, and, and troubled, but we're not gonna get tricked into uh, becoming a, a false solution uh, to a problem. And I will just add to that. My staff probably spends 75% of their time now dealing with homelessness. And, so, and, and honestly, we welcome that opportunity. So um, in addition to dealing with the police department, please continue to deal, hopefully cooperatively, with our office. We get, that, we get your impatience. We get that it's a problem. Um, we're doing everything we can to coordinate with the police, with the county uh, social services, with county mental health, with the providers, with the housing agencies and all the others. It's a complicated, difficult problem, but all of my staff who are here tonight are working, you know, day in and day out to try to address that. So continue to, to work with them and, and we'll get through this together. In that um, vein, Chief, uh, for all the complications that come from uh, homelessness, being homeless is not an entitlement to commit crimes. And so when people encounter 
violent behavior or aggressive behavior, um, that then does become a police issue. And so maybe you can speak to that briefly. I, I can, we are now tracking um, each quarter. We track the number of persons experiencing homelessness that are involved in crime, whether they're a victim or a suspect. Obviously the suspect side is when we can identify people, the victim uh, as well. The vast majority of people, uh, the vast majority of crime occurring with people experiencing homelessness, whether it's a victim or a suspect, is in the violent side, it's not in the property side. And uh, in our arrests uh, and prosecutions of those people who are experiencing homelessness but engaged in some type of violent or property crime are up. Uh, I believe they're up more than 20%. Forgive me, some of these numbers don't always stick in my head. But uh, I can tell you that uh, our, our personnel uh, are not looking, uh, you know, I will, I'll give you a, a parallel that's not the case. Juvenile justice, we are actively and aggressively involved in pre-arrest juvenile justice diversion. And the reason for that is that we believe that when young people, 15, 16, 17 years old, are involved in in crime, not, not violent crime, not robberies or assaulting people, but in property crime, breaking into a car, uh, uh, stealing something, uh, in low level assaults, that a pre-arrest diversion is a, can get them supportive services, can get them help, can get them family counseling, and can keep them from being entered into a, a spiral, a downward spiral of just arrest, incarceration, and now they're out and they can't get to school, they can't go to college, they can't get a job. And so there is a absolute compassionate use of pre-arrest diversion by LAPD for juveniles. Homeless or otherwise, people involved in violent crime, people who are engaged in, in thefts and, and offending on others, this is an area that we're going to make those arrests. We'll allow the criminal justice system to apply rehabilitative services. Uh, we're starting right now in, North, in Hollywood with a pre-arrest diversion for narcotic offenders as yet the latest chapter of trying to get mandated court-supervised treatment uh, because we lost drug courts with Prop 47. Uh, so the department is, we will act compassionately. I, I've committed that when I started my, my tenure as chief to police, with, to police with purpose, compassion, and partnerships. And compassion has a role in policing, an absolute role. And in regards to homelessness, there is a compassion. And those people who are experiencing it, we've got it, we just can't exercise the rule of law. But if they're experiencing homelessness and preying upon others, we're gonna pull, we're gonna, we're gonna protect the others and, and, and we'll use the arm of the criminal justice system uh, to do that. And that job will be made that much easier if we're able to provide housing to those who aren't doing that so that the police can differ, better differentiate between those who are in an unfortunate situation and those who are causing unfortunate situations. All right, um, I wanna shift briefly into traffic. Um, I think people got alarmed a little bit when they saw a lot of the new speed limits being posted that showed increases in posted speed limits. That was for a reason, and one of the reasons was to enable LAPD to do more enforcement of speeding on those streets. So can you speak a little bit to the resources that are being deployed by Valley Traffic to reduce speeding and so, traffic deaths here? So on an overarching point, if there's one legislative change that we should, I'm asking you as, a, as community members to petition your state legislators for, it's the way in which we do speed, law, we do speed uh, zones in the state of California. Uh, they are, uh, it's a formula that's meant for a different time in my view, or for, you know, or for a different city, definitely, uh, that have established speed traps. And one of the basic premise of it is, is that you take the median, the median natural flow of traffic and, you, and it governs the speed limit for that, for that street. And it has an inflationary effect or a rising effect in, in here in the valley because people drive way too fast in, this, in the valley. Right? And so the way the formula has to be applied by state law, if you have a 40 mile per hour speed limit and the median speed on that speed on that street is 50 miles an hour, you end up raising the speed limit to 45. Now there's a limit. If people are driving 90 miles an hour, the, the, the formula doesn't say, well, you have to have a 90 mile per hour speed limit. There is a limit, but, but what we need to do is, is but on a broader scale is we need to change that formula because it does 
create uh, a, a, a heightened speed limit when in reality, just because the median score, I mean, you, got, you guys travel to 170, right? Not, not at eight in the morning, but, but at, at eight or nine at night, people are traveling 80, 90 miles an hour, right? So you can't look at the, medians, the median speed and use that as a means of how the underlying speed limit should be influenced. It should be the safety of the roadway and the safety of the people in the community. And so in Los Angeles, we had to go through the, and pay attention to the formula though because if you don't have a state compliant survey and a requisite speed limit, you can't use speed radar. Officers uh, are very, can write speeding tickets uh, tenfold more when they have the use of radar than when they have to pace the offender. Pacing the offender is, there you go, I gotta catch up with you, I gotta pace you to see what your estimated speed is, then I pull you over and write you a citation. Uh, a laser says, click, you're doing 57, it's a 45, I write you a citation. Speeding violations in the valley have gone up uh, since the council supported the, the citywide surveying of streets. Uh, we have, uh, has now enabled us at the end of 2018 to have surveys over the vast majority of the streets. I think the number is like 90% uh, of, of our high, high injury network ones. And that's where we're out and taking enforcement action. You will see an increase in that enforcement action. Uh, it's already began. And I'll just close by saying, in Los Angeles, as much as I've talked about the need for the police to be in the street, we have nearly 700 personnel, 675 traffic personnel of our 10,030 that are assigned to one of four traffic commands. Nowhere else in American policing, 275 of those are motors. Nowhere else in American policing do you have that level of dedicated traffic enforcement. It is, it is unique. Um, both, vast majority of American policing task the regular line officer with traffic enforcement and investigation. So I'm proud of the work the motors do. Uh, they are expensive, uh, but they have great utility and they're tremendous when it comes to impacting speed violators. For the record, when I was a member of the state legislature, I tried to change that law and uh, went, I went down to the worst defeat I've faced in any legislative effort ever because the car interests throughout this city are unbelievably powerful and the idea of constraining speed uh, was just too much for uh, folks, a lot of folks in the Central Valley in particular to handle and uh, so they don't have the same issues that we have in Los Angeles so it was, it, it it's, it does need to be changed, but I will say this too. I think people drive according to conditions and according to enforcement more than they do according to the posted speed limit. So don't be concerned about changing that, that posted speed limit as long as we have enforcement there. That's what will bring speeds down, not the sign up on the wall. So I have more, Chief, but um, we're really at the, about the end of our allotted, well, let me just ask you one more since it's sort of relevant um, given the state of the teacher st strike and everything now. Um, it's an aggravation for many of us to see the traffic violations that happen around schools, uh, particularly during drop off and pick up, uh, but generally. Um, Carpenter Elementary is adjacent to Laurel Canyon and people are speeding at 60 miles an hour past uh, the school. Colfax uh, has the same situation on, on Colfax. Um, th there's a lot of dangerous traffic conditions and behavior around our schools. Um, what, can, um, what can LAPD do about that? How do you interface with um, school police, uh, right. I guess, and also has the strike impacted that at all? Okay, so the, one of the things that we did do in the last six months is we took the four traffic commands and put them under one bureau as an effort to improve um, their coordination of delivering uh, their strategies and efforts. I will tell you, um, we had the benefit of having these questions in advance and uh, both commands when asked about traffic uh, uh, complaints relative to uh, schools, uh, 
didn't, didn't have them on, on their record. So uh, I think the first thing we need to do is, thankfully you recorded this tonight and my captains can go back and get those locations and they can work with Valley Traffic and with their senior leads and we can put some radar on those locations and we can make some citations and we'll, we'll and like you said, uh, there's nothing like a set of flashing lights to slow people down. And so we will, um, and sign, you know, there's three copies, they gotta sign hard. Uh, but we will we'll take enforcement action and we'll base on those. I encourage, we do work with LA Unified School District Police with, with Steve Zipperman, uh, former captain with LAPD, and our men and women do, at the start of the year and periodically through the year, will visit school sites in their surrounding areas and, and initiate enforcement action. Uh, but I will say also that I think it's your persistence uh, to understand that uh, if you see it getting out of hand and you're, if you're not, if you need to make complaints relative to the conduct, there are dedicated resources within Valley Traffic that just do uh, community complaints and they move throughout the Valley and deal with their assignment every day is to go and work a complaint of activity. And those are motor officers, they have the ability to, to, to make an immediate impact. So I don't know if they're on that, if these schools are on that list, but I would, uh, Andy Nyman is, is there, and, and I know he's, he's willing and able, and, and his command, I know Chris Pitcher will, will work with them, as well as the captains to, uh, to move that. Uh, working with LA Unified, we do work with them on coordinating for school safety. Last issue on this is I really would also encourage the Valley, the challenge with the Valley is these schools were all made in the 50s, and so they don't have valets. They, they were sitting on streets that were meant to not have traffic. Uh, they never imagined ways would take them by that location. <laughs> right? And so these are secondary roads that were never meant to, uh, uh, to, to have the, lo the traffic loads. They also, frankly, were never meant uh, for kids to be dropped off by their parents. They're, so the kids are supposed to walk to school. But um, I'm encouraged because I've seen, though, and I talk, a long way of saying engineering, engineering, engineering. I have in my time in the Valley years ago seen schools take on the task of putting on and installing valets by finding a portion of their yard and changing some traffic patterns that would allow them to put in a different, different drop zone uh, that would uh, help alleviate this. So engineering does have a role uh, in the safety of these schools. And if, um, and as a parent with a five or six year old who's gonna have an investment of five or six years at that school, it's a, it's, I, I'd ring the bell there too, to, to work and encourage the parent organization to work and encourage the school district to change the engineering so that there is a more uh, a, a safer way in which to deal with that uh, and not just try to physically barrier with, uh, with bodies of crossing guards. Thank you very much. The evening is not over, but I do want to just take a moment uh, for all of us to thank you, Chief, for coming out and yeah. joining us here in the Valley. Uh, let's give a hand to Chief Moore. And but I, right, right but I promise, I did promise one thing and I, and I forgot to do it uh, in my conversation. You know, prevention is key. You've heard that, right? Lock it, hide it, keep it. You know, I, you did not talk about the increase, or you didn't talk about burglary thefts and vehicles, but uh, in the south end, I know you've had, an, you've had an increase. Overall, you've got a reduction for the year in North Hollywood, but most of those thefts were preventable by simply locking the vehicle or by taking that iPad or that $900 phone and getting it out of sight. Um, but, uh, you know, so prevention is key, but also your eyes and ears. And Crime Stoppers is here tonight, and I want to recognize them and, and appreciate them as a partner. And if you're not aware of Crime Stoppers, it's a, it, it can be anonymous. It, it can also uh, give you some lunch money that if you, uh, if you have a clue or information about uh, bad guys doing bad things, uh, they can, you can register with them and they, their tips and their leads come to us and we will investigate those and we give them feedback uh, and they do have, uh, have stipends and rewards for those people uh, who, who offer that. But if you just do it out of the goodness of your heart, and, and, and I also appreciate that and really the safety of the community, but they're ineffective. So if you don't want to call the police because you're fearful of that, uh, you're fearful that this is going to come back to you, you can use them as a go-between and they're an excellent partner with us. So thank you for being here tonight. And if I can just build on that for a second, uh, Chief, as we said, we've made great progress in bringing crime rate down over the last 20 years uh, and the last 10 years. Um, that's a combined effort 
of the men and women of the Los Angeles Police Department and of this community. And so um, as we break tonight, there are a number of community groups around the perimeter of the building that you'll have an opportunity to speak with. If you're interested in getting more involved in making your community safe, um, you can talk to LA Regional Crime Stoppers. You can talk to Van Nuys Division uh, CPAB. The Mid Valley Police Council is here. Uh, the NoHo CPAB is here. Valley Glen Neighborhood Council and NoHo West Neighborhood Council, all here um, and available for you to chat with. Um, and we will continue, a few, I, my staff, uh, and some of the officers will continue to be around here as well as we wrap up the evening so that you can engage us in conversation as well. Uh, but I do just want to take one moment before we do that to thank all of my staff for putting this evening on. So if everybody on Team Krikorian could stand up and wave so that everybody can know who you are. Thank you very much for helping to put this on. Um, and I also want to thank Valley College again, all of our organizations for, for being here. Uh, but mostly, I want to thank uh, the men and women of the Los Angeles Police Department and Chief Moore. So.